A BBC journalist living in London went home during his lunch break on a seemingly ordinary day. While he was heading back to work, a sudden piercing pain struck his leg. Someone had bumped into his leg with the pointy end of their umbrella. Confused about the accident, with his leg in pain, the journalist continued to the office, where he noticed a small bump and swelling on his thigh. Within hours, the man was severely ill and had to be hospitalized. Doctors thought he might have blood poisoning, but he adamantly believed that someone intentionally harmed him. How could a stranger's umbrella possibly be the cause? Georgi Markov was a Bulgarian man who worked at the BBC as a journalist and lived in London, England. One day in September 1978, he was working a double and went home for a lunch break after his morning shift. On his way back to the office, he had to board a bus to cross a bridge. As he approached the lineup, he felt a strange stinging pain in the back of his leg. Georgi turned and scanned the crowd around him. There were people gathering for the bus and a man who mumbled an apology as he picked up a dropped umbrella. Georgi Georgi's jeans had a small spot of blood on them, but it wasn't enough to stop him from going to work. He told his colleagues about the strange experience and showed one of his friends his thigh, which had a small bump, like a pimple, and was swelling. Things escalated quickly from there. By nighttime, Georgi was running a high fever and quickly getting worse. He was rushed to the hospital, where doctors guessed he had blood poisoning. While Georgi fought for his life, people scrambled to try to understand his condition. Georgi had been paranoid for some time now that he was the target for assassination attempts. Could his illness have a more sinister explanation? And if so, who wanted to get rid of him? Before Georgi lived in England, he was a famous author and playwright in Bulgaria. He wanted to study literature from a young age, but at the advice of his father, trained as a chemical engineer instead and started teaching the subject. When Georgi was 19, he came down with tuberculosis from having worked in a factory when he was younger. While recovering from his illness, he was able to indulge his love of writing. Georgi's first work was a collection of science fiction short stories, which was successful enough to inspire him to quit teaching. Five years later, he published his breakthrough novel, Muge, about three young men coming of age. It made him a literary star and received praise and awards, and Georgi began to mix with elite society. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. When it comes to cybersecurity, you've probably heard of doxing before, but are you familiar with DDoS attacks? It stands for Distributed Denial of Service, and it's when a hacker sends lots of packets of information to your IP address all at the same time, slowing down your internet service. NordVPN helps you hide your IP through a virtual private network. Instead of your computer being inundated with data, it's just the VPN, so you don't see any service disruptions. NordVPN also encrypts all your data so your ISP can't slow down your streaming speeds. NordVPN has over 5,500 servers worldwide, so you can use Nord service to gain access to geolocked media that's unavailable in your home country. You can even use it to find sales on video games, as well as gain access to international servers. NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there, and you can access it on six devices on every major platform. That's Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, and iOS. Click our link nordvpn.com slash brew in the description to get an additional four bonus months on top of all plans and products. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash brew for four free months on top of any VPN plan. Now, let's get back into it. Georgi's work was so admired that Todor Zhivkov, the Bulgarian leader at the time, invited the promising young writer into his inner circle, hoping that he would create works that supported his regime. Georgi never did that, but as he continued to grow as a writer, his works were denounced and censored by the pro-communist government. Despite this, Georgi became a successful and popular author, though he resented the censorship and political aggression he faced. His plays were closed down and criticized for being, quote, ideologically unsound. 
Georgi's relationship with his home country became even more sour when authorities continued to increase their pressure on him. So in 1969, he left Bulgaria to live with his brother in Italy, leaving behind his wife. After living in Italy for a few years, Georgi tried to extend his passport but was rejected. Instead of returning, he officially relocated to London, England, learned English, and became a journalist and broadcaster at BBC World Service. Back home, Georgi was considered a defector and a wanted man. The Bulgarian Secret Service opened an investigation into him with the nickname The Wanderer. His works were removed from bookstores and libraries, his plays were banned, his name was wiped from all media, and a court sentenced him to over six years in prison. But over in England, Georgi enjoyed freedom and success with his writing, and he became famous for his In Absentia Reports, a weekly radio broadcast that analyzed life in communist Bulgaria. For two years, he also reported through Radio Free Europe, a source of uncensored news and information for countries like Bulgaria who were under Soviet control. Georgi was harsh and openly critical of communist governments, making him an enemy of the regime. Having received threats towards his life, Georgi became paranoid about assassination attempts. He would only eat at home, keep his travel plans secret, and sometimes lock himself in his office. It turns out, he was right to be worried. As he fought for his life after his sudden illness, Georgi recalled his steps to pinpoint what had happened. The experience that stood out to him was the sharp pain in his leg, and he thought about the man with the umbrella who was near him when it happened. The man's face had been turned the other way when he picked up his umbrella, but in hindsight, Georgi remembered that he was a large person in his 40s, and that he had spoken with an accent when he apologized. The man had then quickly entered a taxi and left the scene, which was odd, as most people were around to board a bus. There wasn't much to go on, but the interaction had stuck in Georgi's mind, and he told his co-workers at BBC about it. After one day in the hospital, Georgi went into shock. Doctors tried tirelessly to treat him, but two days later, he had a heart attack and passed away. While his passing was front page news in England, the incident was kept quiet in Soviet circles. Due to the strange circumstances of Georgi's illness and his difficult relationship with the Bulgarian government, Scotland Yard opened an investigation into his mysterious demise. Initially, doctors believed his condition was caused by either septicemia, a form of blood poisoning caused by bacterial toxins, or kidney failure. But during an autopsy, they made an incredible discovery. A tiny metal pellet the size of a pinhead was embedded in Georgi's right thigh. The pellet had extremely small holes in it, but they were empty so doctors didn't know what had been inside it. It was clear that Georgi's illness was not natural, and perhaps the man with the umbrella did have something to do with it. The investigation became more serious, with the British anti-terrorist squad joining Scotland Yard. After several weeks of research and experimenting, a coroner concluded that a poison called ricin had led to Georgi's illness, and it became official that he had been unlawfully killed. The pellet had been injected into his leg, then the poison inside it entered his body. Investigators traveled to France, Italy, Germany, and the US in search of suspects, but none were identified. The case was a worldwide scandal and remained an unsolved mystery until 1993, 15 years after Georgi's death. Ricin is a poison that naturally occurs in castor beans. The castor bean plant is native to East Africa and the Mediterranean, but can be commonly found in tropical and subtropical climates worldwide. Often considered a weed, it's toxic to humans, dogs, cats, and other animals. The uh, beans are not true beans, but seeds that grow on the plant. Ricin can be dissolved in liquid or made into a powder, a pellet, and even a mist. Castor beans are processed worldwide to make castor oil, a vegetable oil used for medical purposes such as to kill cancer cells or in cosmetics for nourishing skin. In the production process, ricin is part of the waste mash left after making the oil. Extracting ricin from the castor beans for poison is a deliberate act. The substance isn't found anywhere else, and castor oil doesn't contain it. When it enters the body, ricin prevents the cells from making necessary proteins. The cells eventually die without the proteins they need, causing damage to the entire body 
and possibly ending someone's life. Ricin poisoning may affect the body differently depending on whether the substance was eaten, injected, or inhaled. If ricin is inhaled, the symptoms would be difficulty breathing, fever, cough, nausea, and a feeling of tightness in the chest, followed by intense sweating and fluid buildup in the lungs. Low blood pressure and respiratory failure are possible and can be fatal. If a person is exposed to ricin through the skin or eyes, symptoms are much less severe. Contact with ricin can cause redness and pain and the added risk of accidental ingestion. Consuming ricin leads to vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, and low blood pressure. Seizures are also possible. It takes several days, but the body's liver, spleen, and kidneys could stop working, which may cause death. Known causes of ricin poisoning are rare, and it's more uncommon for it to be accidentally consumed. But it did happen to a 70-year-old man in Malta. The man was admitted to a hospital due to vomiting, extreme diarrhea, and stomach pain. He was found to have low blood pressure, a racing heart, and dehydration. Ricin poisoning was confirmed when the man showed the doctors some castor beans that he had found outside and eaten 10 of. After a week of supportive care, the man recovered and returned home. Which which is a happy ending to this story, but please, 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 <clears throat> don't eat random beans you find outside. In Georgi's case, the ricin was injected via a pellet, which seems to have caused a mix of symptoms like when the poison is inhaled or ingested. In severe cases, the damage to the organs is the main concern. Signs of ricin poisoning typically show in less than 10 hours, but can be as early as 4 hours after exposure or as late as 24 hours. Depending on the type of exposure, ricin poisoning is fatal within 2-3 to three days. There is no cure for ricin poisoning, so avoiding contact is the only way to be protected from it. If exposure occurs, the most important thing is to get the ricin off or out of the body as soon as possible. If it has been released, people should quickly leave the area, remove clothing, thoroughly wash their body and eyes, and seek medical care. If it was ingested, doctors may flush the stomach, but people should not force themselves to vomit or drink fluids. Medical care includes supportive treatment for the symptoms, such as helping victims breathe, medication for seizures and low blood pressure, and providing IV fluids. Ricin poisoning is not contagious, but if it is on someone's body or clothes, then accidental exposure is possible. Several years after Georgi's passing and after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a shocking confession led to the first break in the case. Two former KGB officers publicly admitted that the Soviets helped commit Georgi's assassination. Oleg Gordievsky, a former KGB colonel, was a longtime double agent who disagreed with the Soviet regime and was a spy for British intelligence. And Oleg Kalugin, a former KGB general who had since left Russia and was involved in the planning of the operation. According to Kalugin, Bulgarian leader Todor Zhivkov had called for Georgi's death in order to silence his most influential critic. Kalugin was at the KGB meeting where they discussed the Bulgarian request for Moscow's help with the plot. The the KGB decided they would provide technical help and their resources, but leave the actual execution of the plan to the Bulgarian government. Actually, more than one plan was executed. Georgi had been the unknowing target of at least three murderous plots. The first one was in Munich, Germany, the spring before his passing. Someone put a toxin in his drink at a dinner party in his honor, but it didn't work. Perhaps because Georgi was always cautious at parties and believed that poison would be the most likely method of assassination. The second attempt was in Sardinia, an Italian island, while Georgi was on a family summer vacation. The third attempt? was the one that took his life. The poison pellet was said to be developed in a top secret KGB lab known as The Chamber. It was confirmed that Georgi's suspicions about the man with the umbrella were spot on. The ricin pellet was reportedly hidden in the tip of the umbrella. It took only 450 micrograms to end Georgi's life. The man with the umbrella was allegedly a low-level Italian criminal, so Georgi's memory of his accent was likely accurate as well. The most popular theory is that the umbrella had a canister of compressed air that could fire the poison pellet at a target. The pellet had a coating on it, designed to melt at human body temperature. So, after it was lodged in Georgi's leg, the coating melted and the ricin was absorbed into his body. 
According to a report in The Guardian, after Todor Zhivkov's fall, a stack of these special umbrellas was found in the Bulgarian Ministry of Interior. Today, this type of umbrella gun is known as a Bulgarian umbrella. Ella, Ella, A, A. Ten days before Georgi was poisoned, a similar umbrella attack targeted Vladimir Kostov, another Bulgarian dissident, while he was in the Paris metro. Vladimir became sick with fever and stiffness but survived because, luckily for him, the pellet had landed in the muscle in his back, away from major blood vessels. The coating on the pellet didn't melt completely, so the ricin wasn't fully absorbed, saving his life. After details of Georgi's poisoning came out, the investigation was reignited. Scotland Yard and Bulgarian officials looked for documentation and evidence of what happened, but the officials who had been involved reacted quickly. Ten volumes of material on the case and all traces of the crime vanished. Vladimir Todorov, the former chief of intelligence in Bulgaria, was found guilty of destroying the files and received 16 months in jail. Stoyan Savov, the deputy interior minister, took his own life instead of facing trial for covering up the crime. And to top it off, Vasil Kotsev, a Bulgarian spy suspected to be the leader of the plot, died in an unexplained car accident. In 1993, Francesco Golino, the main suspect believed to be the Umbrella Man, was found in Denmark and questioned. Unfortunately, the interrogation was inconclusive, and he fled the country. He reportedly passed away in Austria just recently in 2021. At this point, we may never know the full details of the Umbrella assassination, but we have a pretty good idea of the overall plot. Georgi was a brave man who wasn't afraid to speak up when he felt something was wrong, and his work as a reporter provided hope and truth to thousands of people during a time of fear. At the end of the day, it's more important to remember what he stood for during his life. Remember, check out nordvpn.com slash brew for the complete cybersecurity package offer with an additional four months free.